Thanks, it's good to be here, and thank you for your time. I understand that typically uh, experts occupy this stage and they've written books and they come to share with you their knowledge. Um, and I want you to know up front, I am not an expert in anything. What I am is a guy who is an expert in my own failure and the pain and suffering that comes from making wrong choices. So I'd like to begin by asking you to reflect on a question. If you had the opportunity to make $50 million in an insider trading transaction and you were guaranteed not to get caught, would you do it? Ask yourself what percentage of the people in this auditorium would do it? What percentage of the people in the organization would do it? What percentage of the people in your family would do it? For the last seven years, I've taught a course, uh, Ethics and Finance to MBA students at a university. And in the second class, we learn about insider trading and I pose that very same question to my students. They write yes or no anonymously on pieces of paper. I gather up all the papers and I calculate the percentages. So what percentage of over seven year period, I've been calculating this, what percentage of students do you think would take that trade? Just shout out. 40. 40? 75. 75? In, in the ballpark, 67%. So think about what that means. 67% of postgraduate business students going into the field of finance would commit an illegal act if the dollars were big enough and they were guaranteed not to get caught. The real question is why? Why would they cheat? Why would they sacrifice principles for profit? And the answer, goes to the essence of what I want to talk to you about today. The answer, I believe, is the very definition of greed. A voracious, self-centered wanting for excess beyond what is necessary and sufficient. And without an awareness around greed, it can be incredibly seductive. And it can be brutally destructive. So I'm going to share my story and hope to give you a greater awareness around greed through that um, by telling you about how some shortcomings, through some shortcomings in my character, the seductive and destructive force of greed got a stranglehold on me, brought me to my knees, and I betrayed the things that mattered the most to me. My dignity, my values, my family. And how, over the course of the last 14 years, I rebuilt my character, reclaimed the things that mattered most to me by recognizing that character is not something that's black or white. It's not set in stone. Character is malleable, and it's a function of context and circumstance. And so what I had to do was make a hyper-vigilant effort at cultivating virtue and character my entire, through, throughout the last 14 years. Albert Einstein says there are three great forces that rule the world. Stupidity, fear, and greed. And I'm totally clear that stupidity, fear, and greed ruled my life for the first 40 years. And then life dropped this huge boulder on my head and I was forced to wake up. I met some amazing teachers and they drilled these three insights into my head that I'm going to share with you through the context of my story in hope that they will be useful to you on your journey in leadership and life. Psychologists tell us that our childhoods create the conditioning that sets up the core trajectory um, that our lives take. And that typically we have a parent that sets up the major patterning around how we relate to ourselves and how we relate to the world. And for me, it was my father. I remember him in two dimensions. One dimension, he was a hotshot surgeon, drove a Mercedes, wore really slick clothes. Another dimension was a guy that was emotionally shut down, very critical, very judgmental, and very hard on me. So my mind wired up early on that in order for me to be safe, I would have to achieve and be successful financially. In order for me to cultivate the sense of belonging, I would have to achieve financially. Right? My mind wired up that financial achievement would define the foundation of a happy and successful life. So I got into the game of business. 
I started 12 companies over the course of my career. And as I was getting varying levels of success under my belt, I was getting greedier and greedier. And so I migrated to the financial services industry. I set up a merchant bank. This is 1998. Our game plan is to fund early stage internet infrastructure companies, work intensively with management teams, raise subsequent rounds of funding, and get them public at you know, exponential valuations to where we had invested. And um, I needed somebody to do technical due diligence, so I hired a young guy, cum laude, out of an electrical engineering school. Um, and I can, tall, blonde hair, blue eyes, Israeli. I remember in our first interview him saying, Michael, I don't have any interests, I don't have any hobbies, I care about one thing. I want to make as much money as I can, working as hard as I can, as fast as I can. And I thought to myself, where have you been all my life, baby, right? Hired him, after that made him partner. We recruited a small research team, worked 18 hours a day, seven days a week, didn't see my wife, didn't see my kids, totally consumed with building wealth. Dot com boom hit, we get a few of our companies public, I go from having nothing and being worried to, about paying my mortgage to an eight figure net worth overnight and in my mind I thought, I'm 33, in my mind I thought I made it. Right? I got the Porsche, I got the Range Rover, I got the Rolex, I traveled all around the world, first class, best hotels, best restaurants, really indulged in pleasure. And how long do you think that pleasure lasted? For me, six months. Why? Because my psychology was rooted in scarcity. It was rooted in this scarce, competitive, adversarial model of being that I can describe to you in two words. Not enough. I don't have enough. I don't have enough relative to the next guy. There's not enough out there for me. And ultimately, this lie, this core belief that I am not enough. And so, in my mind, I thought, I gotta make more money. I gotta get into like quarter billion, half a billion dollars, right? And so I thought that what you do with this core belief of not enough is you fill it up with more. Does that work? Can you fill up a core belief of not enough with more? Can you solve an internal problem with an external solution? In my mind, I thought I could. So I moved into, so I set up a, a retail investment management company. And it was a very crowded space, so we needed a highly differentiated product. We set up this product that was like a bond, where your principal was guaranteed, except instead of interest as your return, we linked returns to a basket of heavy hitter hedge funds out of New York City. Because at the time, this is 2002, 2003, hedge funds are a very hot and sexy asset class. And we designed this product called the Banknote Trust. And we go out into the marketplace and again, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, my poor wife, kids didn't see me. It was about how do I get to that next level, right? And this product started taking off. We're raising 20 million, then 40 million a quarter, then 50, then 100 million a quarter. And so I needed capital in order to fund the business because it's really taking off and demand is heavy. So I started looking for capital and uh, I'm in my office and my partner comes into my office and he says, Michael, I'm about to deploy $200 million, and I just got off the phone with our guaranteeing bank, and they said because we're buying in such volume, we can get a 15% volume discount. I said, that's fantastic. Do our investors get disadvantaged? He said, no, they still get exactly what we promised them, but because we're buying wholesale, you know, we get that beefy margin. And we looked at each other, and we said, that's 30 million free dollars that we didn't anticipate. At that time, my desire for money, power, recognition, prestige, completely overpowered my desire to live in my moral compass, to live my values, right? To buy wholesale and sell retail is fine. You can do it in any business. You can even do it in the financial services industry as long as you disclose. And we made a conscious choice not to disclose because we thought if we put this into our disclosure material, our investors would find out, our competitors would find out. They'd think we were getting a free ride off our investors' back, which we were, and we wouldn't have been able to sell as much. So what we did was we set up an elaborate offshore structure to hide what we were doing. We went to a big fancy law firm and bought a legal opinion that said everything that we were doing was legal. 
that we thought would protect us and window dress what was in effect a highly unethical and dishonest move. And onward we went. 100 million a quarter, 150 million a quarter, 200 million a quarter. We were raising more money than banks and mutual funds. I had a high power executive team that reported to me. I had offices around the country and I was salivating about this exit at a half a billion dollars that I thought we were gonna get. And I was often intoxicated with the notion of success and power. One day I'm at the gym doing my workout and I get a call, and I never got a call. I always worked out from 12 to 2. Nobody ever called me from 12 to 2. I got a call. I picked up the phone. It was my partner. He said, Michael, eight people from the enforcement team of the Securities Commission just walked into our office, and they want to speak to us. I said, what do they want? He said, I don't know. Just get over here fast. The walk from the gym to my office was the longest walk of my life. My stomach is churning, my heart is pounding, my mind is catastrophizing. What if you know, we get charged? What if this gets in the paper? What if I lose my company? Right? I get to the elevator bank, I ride up the elevator. I stand outside the boardroom, I take a deep breath. I put on my mask of fearless confidence and I walk inside. The head of the enforcement team says, hello, sir. We want to understand a little bit about your operations and we'd like to begin by asking you a few questions. I said, no problem, you know, I'd be happy to help. I'm just gonna go get settled in my office. Everybody okay for coffee, water? Okay, all right, I'll be right back. With that, I beeline into my office. I pick up my phone, I call my lawyer. I say, Mike, eight people from enforcement just walked in and they wanna speak to me, what do I do? He said, well, you don't actually have to talk to them. Remember, we separated the portfolio management license which is under their jurisdiction from the securities distribution side of the company. So it's actually your partner that's under their jurisdiction and it's him that has to speak to them. I said, that's fantastic. Can you send me that in writing? He said, sure. So I go back into the boardroom. I tell everybody that my partner's gonna be helping them and um, I'm around if they need anything and I answer a few more questions and I excuse myself and I go out into the organization to try and calm the moral outrage as a result of the fact that we are getting audited by the Securities Commission. About three weeks later, I get a call from my partner. I said, Michael, the Securities Commission is really uncomfortable with our structure. They don't like what they see. They're putting a cease trade order on the business. It's gonna go public. It's gonna get in the media. We're too young to bear this kind of publicity. I think we're finished. Didn't sleep that night, agitated, tossing and turning. I get out of bed in the morning, I go downstairs, open the door, I pick up the newspapers and there it was on the front page, business section of both papers, scandal, commission moves against Portis, which was the name of my company at the time. And I can barely read it, I'm kind of, it's all fuzzy, but I see my name all of it and it's like this, the media is turning me into a crook. And I just put, threw the papers down and I thought, my reputation is completely damaged across the entire business community. I eventually had to fire everybody in the organization and I, I was built with the ability to withstand a lot of stress for whatever reason, but firing good people who had mortgages in scandal it was almost too much for me to bear. I, I, I pulled everybody into the boardroom, cross conference call across the country, you know, gave a farewell speech, handed out notices of termination. I went into my office and I broke down and I cried. And I hadn't cried since I was a little boy. But as human beings, we're adaptive, right? So I'm adapting to my new norm. Okay, the Securities Commission is I gotta manage my lawyers, I gotta manage the little bit of money that I have left, I gotta figure all this out. I'm in the kitchen preparing breakfast, more in a more adaptive place, I get a call from my partner. Michael, checkmate. I said, what do you mean checkmate? He said, you know the $50 million offshore fund that KPMG froze? I said, yeah. 
He said, I just convinced the Swiss bank to release 15 of the $50 million, and I wired the money to an offshore haven, so now no matter what happens, we got gunpowder to fight legal with, and we got, and we got a safety net in case all hell goes loose. I'm like, you did what? And I got off the phone with him, and I'm going to tell you honestly, my first reaction to what he did was relief. Because as a result of legal expenses, living expenses, and investment losses, all the money that I made had evaporated down to nothing. Right? And I figured at least in a worst case scenario, if I end up in jail, I'll have something to support my wife and kids with. And my next thought was, Holy crap. This was a civil disclosure issue. All of the money and the investments were in a prime brokerage account. Now there's theft, it's criminal, and there's money missing, and I'm a part of this. And I didn't know what to do, right? I didn't know where to turn. I mean, what do you do, right? Like, you, 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 you know, you, there's, there's $15 million, 7.5 is yours. Do you take the 7.5 million? And now, well, at least if I have no money, I'll be able to fund a, a great legal uh, defense. And if I have to go to jail, my family will be supported. Or do you say, no, I don't touch that money because I've stolen money, which you don't have the money to fund the great legal defense, which increases the probability of you potentially going to jail and your wife and kids not getting supported, right? For some people, it's a no-brainer. They take the money. For some people, it's a no-brainer. They'd never take the money. I didn't know. And to make matters worse, three weeks later, we both got charged with multiple counts of fraud. So I'm panicking, right? I am in a state of total overwhelm. I don't know who to talk to. I don't know where to go, what to do. I'm doing intensive, intensive religious study, you know, asking the big questions. Is there a God? Why am I here? Why did this happen to me? I'm in intensive therapy, trying to understand my mind and how it worked. I'm reading 10 self-help books a week. Nothing's helping. And then I was introduced to a lady who I had a conversation with, kind of like a counselor, who I thought was incredibly powerful and clear and wise, so I decided to go see her. And, and I can remember in, you know, in one of our few sessions that I went in, I walked in, I'm filled with righteous indignation. I'm angry at my partner. I'm angry at the prosecution, the commission, KP. I'm angry at the world. And she sees me and she says, okay, listen, I see you're angry. Let me ask you a question. What was your sin? I said, my sin? I was playing the game like guys do. I was in finance. I don't think I was doing anything other than different than a lot of people do in finance. I don't have, I didn't do anything wrong. The world is against me. She said, really? She said, what was your part in this? I said, I don't know. She said, it starts with a G. I still didn't know. She said, greed. And when she said that, I got pissed off because I didn't want to take responsibility that I was a part of creating all of these things that happened to me. I wanted to play victim and blame everybody else. Right? But there was a part of me that was actually relieved because she had named what was true. And now I could see this character trait that was so destructive to me and so many people and I could begin to heal it. And I came to understand that from my greed, no amount of money was ever enough for me. I always lusted after more money, more accolades. And from my greed, I didn't care about my clients. I didn't care about my investors. I cared about myself, my ego, and my pocketbook. That's the thump the ego makes. And from my greed, I was deceptive and manipulative in using part of my investor's money to finance the growth of my business. And she said, this is good. You're getting honest with yourself. I said, it doesn't feel good. She said, well, here's what I want you to do next. I want you to go tell some people. Who do you want me to tell this to? Start with your mother. Tell your wife, tell your friends, tell your brother, tell your sister. So I went out and I said, I was dishonest in business. I was playing a big game. I'm in big trouble, and I'm scared. 
And people ask me often, you know, did family and friends kind of shun you after you went through this whole kind of debacle? And actually the opposite was true. What I got was love, understanding, and compassion. And I think there are two reasons for that. The first is, you know, I was blessed with really great people in my life. But the second is I wasn't arrogant and evasive and vague. I was vulnerable, transparent, and honest. And I learned that, you know, in our vulnerability, there is just so much power um, to connect. It's a very powerful leadership trait. And so I did start feeling better. I felt like, you know, even though um, I was potentially going to jail, I felt like this 2,000 pound weight had been taken off my chest. So I went in to, um, to visit my counselor again. And she said, hello, Michael. I said, what are you calling me Michael for? My name is Michael, Michael Mendelssohn. She said, you have been born anew. And it was like, you know, the room got quiet because I realized that I actually was a different person than when I first came in to see her. And I got, I got emotional around it. And she said, have you ever thought about changing your name? Because you know, in many traditions throughout the centuries, when people want to create a new trajectory for their lives, it's actually quite common to change your name. I said, well, it's kind of weird, but you know what? I'm getting slaughtered on Google search. It could be a great way for me to kind of reinvent myself. She said, don't do it because you're hiding. No more hiding. Do it because it's an external reflection of an internal transformation. And so I listened to her and I reflected on that. And then, without a second's notice, like just like a punch in between the eyes, she goes, now how about these criminal prosecution hearings? I said, well, what do you mean? They're kind of ongoing. She goes, well, look, you've gotten honest with yourself. You've gotten honest with your friends and family. Do you want to get honest with them too? I said, what, tell them that I was greedy, selfish, and dishonest? She goes, how about telling them the situation, the conditions, what happened, your involvement? I said, if I do that, I may end up in jail. She said, you may end up in jail anyways, but at least if you tell the truth, you will end up in jail with your human dignity. She said, you may end up physically imprisoned and freer than you've ever been in your life, Mikhail, having released yourself from the inner prison. And like, this is heavy, man. What's on the table here? I, I, I don't, I, so I'm still, I got some resistance. And I said, well, what about my partner? Wouldn't I betray my, my partner? And she said, Mikhail, do you really think your partner has your best interests at heart? She said, you can never go wrong standing in your truth. And when she said that, it hit me like a ton of bricks, right? Because I realized that I had gotten so caught up in greed and clever manipulations that I'd completely lost my way. And now to connect with my partner and be complicit in this $15 million theft, I would be a living betrayal of my values. And I had three young daughters. And how can I look these little girls in the eyes and, and be the man I want to be and say, you got to be honest in life in order to be happy if I'm conniving in order to get you know, my piece of the $15 million. So I made the decision there and then. I said, my life from this point on has got to be about truth and honor. And that choice was a 180 degree shift from my worldview, right? As a boy who couldn't trust his father, I trusted no one. Life is a zero sum game, kill or be killed, survival of the fittest. Um, always think five steps ahead, always be the smartest guy in the room. And if you're not, you're not working hard enough, right? Identity construct. And now, I'm looking at going to jail, I lost all my money, I don't know for how long I'll be there, I don't know how my wife and kids are going to be supported. And I just had to surrender all of that. I had to let go and I had to trust. I had to trust that if I do the right thing, the right thing's going to happen. I had to trust that life's got our back, that it's friendly. 
right? I had to trust life. And that was the first lesson that I learned, was to just to let go and to trust. And so my next step after that was to pick up the phone and call my partner and ask him to give back the money so that we could be honest and work this out. And unfortunately, he hadn't had the spiritual transformation that I had, and he was like, no effing way. They destroy my business, they destroy my reputation, this is all, whatever. So we had this huge, we had, we had a, a falling out, um, and my next steps were quite clear. I, I called my lawyers, I said, I wanna go sit down with the prosecution, and I wanna tell them everything. Lawyers thought that wasn't the best idea because they could use it against me. And I said, I'm resigning as master of my universe. I ain't doing a good job. I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna trust that if I do the right thing, the right thing will happen. And after five days of grueling interviews and three months of grueling negotiations, because the dollars were so big, you know, we were in $800 million. Um, this had gone to the Department of Justice, so it had gotten a little bit political, and they wanted jail time. And so I had these three little girls, and I wanted to get on with my life, and this would have been a five-year fight. So I agreed to one count of fraud, two years in a federal pr prison, with um, the provision that I could get out within six months on good behavior. The choice to go to prison was horrendous, right? The choice to put my personal safety at risk in the face of violence was horrendous. Right? The choice to further damage my reputation was horrendous. But none of that was the worst part. The worst part was the Friday night before I went in. My wife and I telling my young daughters, I had one daughter that was 10, one daughter that was seven, and one daughter that was four, that we had to tell them something. And them gathering around the table after dinner and looking up with me, they all had these blue, big beautiful blue eyes and long flowing hair. What daddy, are we gonna go to the treat store? No, my darlings, I gotta tell you something serious. Daddy made some mistakes and I gotta go away for six months, maybe a little longer. No, Daddy, why? And I'm seeing like the fear in their eyes because Daddy made some bad choices. And whenever we make choices, there's always consequences. Well, can we come visit you, Daddy? No, my darlings, you're not gonna be able to. And the look of terror in their eyes. And my big one started bawling, and she grabbed my stomach, and she goes, no, Daddy, it's not fair. You can't go. And my middle one grabs my neck and goes, Daddy, you're going to miss my birthday. Right? And my wife's crying, and they're crying, and I'm crying. That was the worst part. Seeing the consequences of my choices in the tears of these little precious girls' eyes. And as I was getting ready to go inside, uh, I amped up my mixed martial arts practice, which I had been doing for four years. I amped up my meditation practice so I was physically confident and I was calm. Um, trying to kind of prepare for mortal combat zone. And nothing, I'll tell you, nothing can prepare you for going landing up in prison, right? Nothing can prepare you for waking up in an orange jumpsuit in a 10 by 10 jail cell. Nothing can prepare you for the violence. It's not one-on-one -on -one fights, it's five-on-one. Guys get beaten to shreds and the guards don't get in the way. And nothing can prepare you for the lockdowns when there's a stabbing on another range and you can't leave your little cell for like three days and every second feels like an eternity and a sense of hopelessness and despair come in. Like nothing can prepare you for that. But as I, got, as I kind of got through the trauma of it, the capital T trauma of it, um, you know, a funny thing happened. I guess because of all the work I was doing on myself and my ego, my ego was disintegrating and my heart was opening up. I looked at these inmates and they just, they were, they were mentally tormented and misdirected and I just had so much compassion for them. Like this compassion welled up and I was like, how can I help you? I'll listen to you, I'll be your psychologist, I'll help you position your parole hearing, which is a marketing exercise. I go, well, what can I do, how can I help? 
And it was really interesting because my, my whole life and the way that I kind of even went in there was protection from a place of fear, right? My assets, my reputation, my image, my family. We're protecting all of the time. And that's even the way I went in there was mixed martial arts, right? But then all of my ego attachments get stripped. Right? I don't have a house anymore. I don't have a family. I don't have anything except for this heart, right? And this heart was ready to open. And then it did open. And I was in service. And being in service to these people actually had the days pass in a, in a fulfilling way. And I learned the power of servant leadership in prison, ironically. And that was my second big lesson, was, was the power of, of have, being open-hearted and compassionate and having the intention of service. So we're coming to the end, so, I'm get, so I get out. Unfortunately, all those great lessons didn't stick, right? And I'm thinking, I'm scared, and I'm like, okay, how am I gonna rebuild myself? And I thought, okay, I know what I'm gonna do. I, I used to be hotshot finance entrepreneur, now I'm gonna be Mr. Transformation. I'm gonna write a book, I'm gonna get on the speaker series, I'm, I'm gonna get on Oprah, I'm gonna show the world the master of the universe, I really am. And I still had this beautiful teacher. And I walked in to see her, to tell her all my grand plans, and she said, you are an arrogant egomaniac. I said, I know, but I'm working on it. She said, working on what? Have you learned anything? I'm surprised your head even got through the door. And I got pissed off with her. I said, let me tell you something. I'm living on fumes. I got to make a living. I'm getting slaughtered on Google search. I have got to rebuild my reputation. My wife is furious with me. I've destroyed our financial future. She's horrified of whether I'll be able to provide to my wife and kids in the, in, in the future. And when I can get my butt out of bed and I look in the mirror, I can't stand the guy that I see. So you tell me, oh, wise one, what should I do? And she said, there's one solution to all of those problems. I said, great, tell me. Oh, what do you think it is? I don't know, you want me to go be in service more to people? She said, that's good, but that's not it. You want me to um, go apologize and kind of reconstruct the debt? That's good too, but that's not it. I said, I don't know. She said, it starts with an H. I said, I still don't know. She said, humility, Michael. You must understand the nature of humility. It is where all of your power is. And when she said that, it was like every cell in my body just relaxed because now I could stop all of the cleverness and manipulation trying to cover up that sense of inadequacy that the boy inside was still feeling. Right? Now I could stop trying so hard to be somebody I wasn't. Right? And I learned that humility lives on, on this continuum. Yes, on one side you have ego and arrogance and pride. And on the other side, you have low self-esteem, feelings of unworthiness, feelings of inadequacy, right? which we all have at time to time. And so I learned that I came from that insecure, inadequate place based on my childhood, and I pulled myself into error. I'm going to build a billion-dollar fund. Then I went back into low self-esteem. Then I could shift myself back into pride and ego, right? And I learned that humility is this divine middle ground where we're not better than anybody and we're not worse than anybody. You've got nothing to be proud of and you've got nothing to be ashamed of. Right? Humility is acceptance of what is. It is service from a place of compassion. Humility is the master key that unlocks the bondage of ego. Because if you're not better than anybody and you're not worse than anybody and you've got nothing to be ashamed of and you've got nothing to be proud of, what do you have? What's available to you? Everything, right? Possibility. But without that, we often toggle back and forth in our own inner prisons. She went on to tell me that my problem was that I look at situations, circumstances, and events to use them to fill myself up. And she said, you gotta flip that on its head. You need a transformation to a service-oriented consciousness. You gotta look inside and say, what do I have? What are my gifts and talents that I can use 
to be in service to other people. She said, what'd you learn in prison? I said, I learned to serve. She said, take that service into your life, into all of your life. Give up the desire for the fancy this and the fancy that and the house and the suits and the, the, the cars and the towers of Babel and just be simple. Peace and fulfillment live in simplicity. Simple, focus, heart. That is your essence. Let that essence be your guide. So I finally started to have some of that wisdom sink into my skull. And, um, you know, as a result of a lot of hard work and good fortune, um, I say through no virtue of my own, I still have my marriage. We're going to be celebrating our 25th anniversary in May. Um, I try to show up for my kids and be a loving presence for them. And, you know, one's in university, one's going to university. So they seem to be no high-risk behavior. They seem to be okay. In my job, I um, work with leaders and leadership teams, helping them grow through challenge and change, grow through transformation like I went through, so that they can be more effective and fulfilled in their daily lives. And I offered to tell my story to students. Right? I wanted to go out to students and tell them so that they don't make these same mistakes. And after one guest lecture, I got hired on faculty to a major university to teach ethics and finance to an MBA program, which is the prison to professor in five years, right? Miracles, like total. I didn't architect um, a recovery and a, and a career rehabilitation. What all I did was I stayed set steadfast in my practice to serve with an open heart, right? My life unfolded beautifully and organically when I redefined success, redefined success as an act of continuously working on myself and being in service to other people. 14 years, and it seems to have worked. And I, I'll tell you, I still shift back. I have this alter ego I call Slick Mickey, where I want to do deals, want to make money, you know, all of these things. But I got to stay mindful that that's not a scorecard that I consciously chose. That is a scorecard that I adopted from a society that has me chasing and grasping my entire life. Psychologists call it hedonic adaptation or the hedonic treadmill. We want to get that job, want to get that salary, want to get that house, want to get that spouse, whatever it is. We get it, we adapt feel empty, miserable, set the new goal, adapt, empty, miserable, on this perpetual cycle of dissatisfaction. And that was my story. I work hard, be successful, achieve, make money, then I'll be happy. Right? That formula for me, and as far as I see, many other people didn't work. So there's another way. I'll leave you with this. The sum of my experience has taught me First of all, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with achievement, okay? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with working hard and having nice things, right? What I'm saying is if we make that our sole focus, achievement and material things, we set ourselves up to be vulnerable to those three great forces that rule the world, stupidity, fear, and greed, and at best, we, feel em we can feel empty at the end of our lives. So what I'm saying is if we recalibrate that focus and put some of our energy and intention into developing who we are as a people, right, cultivating virtues, and then when we act from that balanced place, then we're in a position to really create an enduring sense of value for ourselves, you know, for our, our organizations, for our communities, for our families, and ultimately for the world. And so if any of this resonates with you, my invitation is to take a little bit of today and just reflect. You know, how focused are you on achievement? And how focused are you on cultivating virtue? And if it feels right, maybe you want to recalibrate a little bit. And with that, I thank you so much for, allow, for giving me your time and allowing me to come here and serve you. Thank you. I'll take any questions. I'm an open book. Hi, thanks for the talk. Sure. Um, what are your tactics or strategies in your day-to-day -day when you feel yourself
slick, uh, slipping back to, what was it, Slick Mickey? Slip, Mick, um, slick Mickey. Get yourself back to the middle. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I would say that the, the uh, it's a practice, right? So it's a, it's a, a practice of deep mindfulness. Um, it's being really aware of mental emotional reaction patterns. It's being really aware of what happens in my physical body and when tension comes up. And with that awareness, coming into three deep breaths, right? Stimulates the vagus nerve, which is command central for the parasympathetic nervous system, which releases neurotransmitter that's like Valium. Three deep breaths, best tool in the world. And then from that, those three deep breaths, refocus awareness to what is my purpose and what are my real values, right? So it's kind of like get, recalibrate, get conscious, check in with value system, make choice, I would say. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing your journey. Thank you. So initially, you asked a question, you know, one of the premises was, you know, if there was no chance of, of getting caught. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how germane that is, you know, one sees people doing things, even when there's every chance of getting caught, and mm -hmm. they still do it. You know, I'm thinking of the, you know, the college, recent uh, college admission scandal, whatnot. Mm -hmm. What's, what's mm -hmm. your take on that? Mm -hmm. On the college in it. Or just, you know, the, the fact that people will do these things even when there's, there seems to be every chance of getting caught from, you know, the outside perspective. Yeah. What leads people to do things like that? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, not to be overly simplistic, but I think this kind of goes to the essence of greed. And it may not be just greed for money, but, you know, greed for, I want my kids to have a certain image. And I'm prepared to cross ethical boundaries in order to get that. And I have such a sense of entitlement that I can actually pull this off uh, that I'm going to do it. You know, so it was almost, it was almost like this, this, you know, this delusion that, 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 that people live in. And, you know, they're, they're not, they, don't, they don't acknowledge that, well, my kid's going to get in. Maybe they're not going to be the brightest student and maybe they're going to fail out. Or even when they get out, even when they graduate, you know, then what? Right, um, and what are the ramifications of, um, you know, making them think that they have a level of capability that they don't really have, and what does that do to their mental health down the line? Right. So I would say, you know, it's still it's still a a, a derivative of that voracious self-centered wanting, without really thinking about, hey, what are the consequences of these choices? Thank you. Hi, so thanks again for being here. Uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning that you believe character is malleable, mm -hmm. and I agree. I think that people can really change. Um, but there's also a line somewhere, and there are things that people would consider unforgivable. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you were able to receive forgiveness from the people closest to you, mm -hmm. but I wonder how you think about that line and if there were others who refused to forgive you and sort of how you think about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I'll tell you, the biggest challenge for me was forgiving myself, right? Um, once I could come into a deeper place of self-forgiveness, because it was, we're not talking about a two out of 10 on mistakes, right? It's like a pretty serious mistake. Once I could get to that self-forgiveness place, um, what other people thought mattered less and less. When I didn't forgive myself, there was some self-loathing in there, right? Like, dude, you're such an, how could you do, you know, all of that stuff. When other people didn't forgive me or had a negative opinion of me, like it really hurt, it would kind of go to the, go to the gut. But self-forgiveness is, uh, you know, it's a journey, right? And, but that once I get there and I understand that, you know, uh, I'm a human being, I'm imperfect, I make mistakes, I, I am, Unconscious, more conscious than I was in the past, but you know I have a certain level of consciousness, and I'm and I'm on this certain journey, and everybody else is too. So I judge people less, and you know I mean listen, I've done this talk uh, a few times. I did it to a whole huge room of Type A investment bankers, and people are like, "Are you serious? Are you really going to walk into that?" Um, and th uh, they they were actually great, but there were people that said, no, "Yeah, this guy's still a crook." Yeah, he's, he's, people don't change, right? I saw that more as him projecting his own issues um, in his own sense of guilt on me. And, I'm, and, and I just say, you know what? You can have your opinion because I know the truth, right? Every day, yeah, I made some mistakes. But, you know, look, we get up in the morning. We look ourselves in the mirror. We say, was I the best husband, son, friend, 
employee. It was like the best I can be, right? That's all we can do. So thank you for your question. I appreciate it. Yeah. So my question is about if, how do you see people having their aha moment if they don't have a low like you had? I mean, mm -hmm. yours was pretty, mm -hmm. uh, you know, pretty impactful in your mm -hmm. life. So if that mm -hmm. hadn't happened to you, if you hadn't gotten caught, do you think you would have eventually come to this conclusion? And mm -hmm. for people who, you know, want to sort of have this level of enlightenment, mm -hmm. how do they come to that conclusion sure. if they don't have like yeah. a rock bottom yeah. that they hit? Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, hopefully they can learn from non numbskulls like me. <laughs> Which is why, you know, I'll do this talk anywhere, anytime, don't have to pay. Like, I just want to help people so that they can, because there are people that do have transformation after I, after I tell this story, depending on where they are, you know, in their, in their particular life journey. You know, my theory, and this is a bit of a spiritual theory, is that life gives us warnings. And it's up to us to, you know, be sensitive to some of the nuances. You know, and I've heard I've heard the analogy that sometimes life will drop a feather on our shoulder, and if we don't um, acknowledge the feather, it turns into a pebble, um, a rock, a bigger rock. Apparently, I had such a thick skull, I got the boulder. But I think that there are signs. I think that there are signs, and and I I believe that everybody's got this 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 journey in life, and there's lessons that 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 they have to learn, and. Um, in some ways, it's almost like a flower doesn't blossom in nature until all of the conditions surrounding it are just right. I think human transformation works in that same way. Like we can, we can water the soil, we can nurture, we can do all of these things, but you know, there's a certain mystery as there is in nature. And until that sort of unfolding is ready to happen, you know, it can't happen. Well, thank you very much for having me. All the best.